Hi, this is Dr. Cook, your Chem 240 instructor. Let's take a look at the next video. In this video, we're going to talk about details that determine whether the reactions occur through an SN2 mechanism or through an SN1 mechanism. One of those details is the degree of alkyl substitution of the alkyl halide substrates. If we take a look at the various reactivity differences between them, what we can see in an SN2 reaction illustrated by the substitution of a bromide for an iodide is that a compound that has only hydrogens attached such as bromomethane reacts 221,000 times faster than bromopropane which has a bromine on a secondary carbon and in between that reactivity is a primary bromide which has only one alkyl group and if you get up to three substitution groups on there or a tertiary halide the reactivity is so low that it's even too small to measure the reaction does not take place and the reason is because the reaction is crowded so here you can see with just hydrogens it's wide open and if this substitution reaction occurs in one step then the nucleophile has to come from the back side kicking off the leaving group um, in this case the bromide so uh, if it's wide open and free you can get in there easily as you get more and more substitution that gets crowded and essentially it gets blocked so the nucleophile cannot reach the back side of the carbon that the reaction is taking place on. Thus, it's fastest when we have no substitution on the carbon. It gets slower if it's a primary, and the reaction occurs even more slowly if it's a secondary halide, and the reaction essentially cannot occur if it's a tertiary halide. So the steric effects of the substrate, the more substituted it is, the more difficult it is to do SN2 substitution reactions. General rule of thumb, uh, only methyls, primaries, and secondaries can do SN2 reactions, tertiaries cannot. What about the leaving group? There are differences in reactivities of the leaving groups depending on how weak their bonds are. And as I talked about in terms of halogens, and I want to focus on the halogens, um, if we look at fluorine as being set to a relative rate of the reaction of 1, chlorine is 200 times more reactive than a fluorine. Uh, bromine, 10,000 times, and an iodine, 30,000 times. So you can see that the trend of the reactivity of the halogens is exactly as we predicted based on the bond strengths weakening as you go from fluorine to iodine. Obviously, fluorines are relatively inert and are very difficult to do these kinds of reactions. So if you want to try to do a substitution directly kicking off an OH group or an NH2 group, that's going to be very, very difficult as well. Also, there are leaving groups that are better than the halogens, such as a tosylate group. Um, we're not going to focus too much on tosylates, but I just want to mention that other kinds of leaving groups can also be utilized for substitution reactions besides just the halogens. Well, how does this all relate to the SN1 mechanism? To remind you what the SN1 mechanism is, it's a two-step reaction where the rate only depends on one thing, hence a unimolecular reaction, because the first step of the reaction is the generation of a carbocation from the alkyl halide. So the halogen bond breaks to form the halide, generating a carbocation intermediate. That's the slowest step or the rate determining step. In the next step, the nucleophile, in this case neutral water, will add to that carbocation in a second step. So what's going to be important for the success or rate of this reaction only depends on the leaving group ability and the stability of the carbocation that's generated. Here we can see the relative rates for the reactions for an SN1 substitution reaction. And what we can see is that the degree of alkyl substitution also has a dramatic effect, but opposite that of an SN2 reaction. That is, a methyl group essentially is unreactive, as is a primary halide, essentially unreactive. But a secondary compound can undergo some reaction. It's about 12 times more reactive than a primary. But if you look at the tertiary substrate, you can see it's 1.2 million times more reactive. Why is that more reactive? Well, again, in order to break the carbon-halogen bond and generate a carbocation, you need to stabilize the carbocation. And tertiary carbocations are much more stable than secondary, much more stable than primary, much more stable than methyl carbocations. So in this case, the rate of the reactions for an SN1 reaction has everything to do with the ability to stabilize the plus charge on the carbon. And essentially, only tertiary compounds are capable of undergoing easy SN1 reactions.
It's possible SN1 reactions can occur on a secondary halide. It's significantly slower than a tertiary halide. Well, what about nucleophiles in these reactions? We've talked a lot about the degree of alkyl substitution and how it affects these various reactions. It's slow if it's crowded for an SN2 reaction. It's fast if it's more substituted for an SN1 reaction because it stabilizes the carbocation. If we think about an SN2 reaction, the nucleophile is also involved in the rate determining step because it's only a one-step reaction. And thus the strength of the nucleophile matters a lot. We can describe nucleophiles as being very good nucleophiles. Notice all of these are negatively charged, so the charged species are more reactive. And things like bromide iodide, uh, sulfides, um, even some of these alkoxides, and I should point out cyanide, CN minus, these are all very, very good nucleophiles. Medium reactive nucleophiles tend to be those that are a little bit more stable. So when you have carboxylates, which have resonant stabilization of the negative charge, those are a little less reactive. The halogens, which are the most electronegative, are tend to be less reactive as nucleophiles. The neutral nucleophiles are also moderate in terms of the sulfur compounds and amine compounds, nitrogen compounds. These have moderate reactivity as nucleophiles. Um, and tend to not be as good in an SN2 reaction. Very poor nucleophiles are those that are things like um, acids or uh, direct alcohols. In that case, you need to have very reactive carbocation in order to react. And so these would only participate typically in an SN1 type reaction where we first generate a very reactive carbocation species. The solvents have a dramatic effect in these reactions as well. When we think about the substitution reaction, it is a polar reaction. And so in order to carry out these reactions, we need to be able to have solvents which can solubilize ions and polar species. So if you think about uh, different types of solvents, they can range in their abilities to stabilize ions and polar molecules. For example, if you just have things like alkanes, um, halogenated compounds generally tend to be a little bit less polar. Uh, benzene, these are very nonpolar types of solvents and ions cannot readily dissolve in those. When we think about solvents which are polar, they have some functionality where we have polarized bonds within it. So in this case of methanol or ethanol, you can see you have a carbon oxygen bond which is polar. Water is a very polar molecule. Acetonitrile, uh, HMPA, DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, or dimethyl formamide. These are all solvents which are also polar, but the difference is that we refer to these as aprotic, meaning they don't have a protic hydrogen attached. Acetic acid, water, alcohols, these are all what we refer to as protic polar solvents because they have this somewhat acidic hydrogen that can undergo hydrogen bonding. These polar solvents do not have those acidic hydrogens that we see on the protic solvents. So these are referred to as aprotic solvents. These solvents vary in various polarities as you can see from this chart. If we take a look at the SN2 substitution reaction, this reaction which occurs in one step, what we have is a nucleophile that is reactive that has to react with the electrophile. The transition state and the nucleophile we start with are polar species and they're ions. They have charges. The leaving group has to be stabilized as we come off. So what we can see here, if we compare different solvents, methanol having a relative rate of one, what we see is water is a little bit faster than methanol. Dimethyl sulfoxide, 1300 times more reactive. Dimethyl formamide, acetonitrile, hexamethyl phosphotriamide, the reaction occurs fastest in that. What is the difference between these solvents here and the solvents on the left? That is, these are protic solvents, and these are aprotic solvents. And we see some polarity increases as you go among those aprotic polar solvents. So how do we explain this difference in reactivity with these solvents and why does it matter? They all have some degree of polarity. Well, let's take a look at dimethyl sulfoxide, this solvent on the upper right, and how it might interact in this particular reaction. If we take a look at the starting material nucleophile, in this case hydroxide, or it's usually sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, we do need solvents that are polar to help stabilize that and make those ions soluble in the solution. So for example, if you have a polar solvent like dimethyl sulfoxide where you have negative ends, 
these oxygens that can surround the cation and stabilize it, and the positive ends of the sulfurs, which can surround the negative charge species and stabilize it. That's how we solubilize these ions in solution. At the same time, what we don't want is to completely make the nucleophile unreactive. If you have protic solvents, such as water in this case, those waters actually form what we call hydrogen bonds to that nucleophile, and by surrounding it too tightly, it actually makes those nucleophiles less available to do reactions. So it decreases the reactivity of nucleophiles. This is why we want polar solvents which can solubilize these ions, but we don't want them protic because the nucleophile is important in the SN2 reaction. It's involved in this one-step reaction and the reactivity of that is going to matter. Compare this now to an SN1 reaction where the important part of the reaction is the formation of the carbocation and the ionization of the halide off of this. If you take a look at the solvents that are present for these protic solvents, you can see an interesting trend that's different than what we saw with SN2. Here we have acetic acid with a relative rate of one. Compare that to methanol with a relative rate of four. A, a formic acid, 5,000 times more reactive, and then water, which is the most polar, is 150,000 times more reactive than acetic acid. And these are protic solvents. The important part of this reaction doesn't involve the nucleophile, so we don't have to worry about the reaction being inhibited by protic solvents. As a matter of fact, what we want is this hydrogen bonding to the ions to help stabilize it. Water does undergo hydrogen bonding to various things. The nucleophile is only important in the second or slowest step of this reaction. The first step is the rate determining step, which doesn't impact that at all. The loss of the iodide is important. Stability of the carbocation and ionization of those species. The nucleophile is in the second step. Let's take a look at how this solvent might affect that. So what you can see is that the carbocation is still stabilized by the polar water molecules and the halide, I've illustrated bromide in this case, hydrogen bonds and that helps that to come off and be stabilized. So the more we can stabilize these species, the better it's going to be when the reaction is proceeding. So protic solvents are ideal for the SN1 reaction. In an SN1 reaction, we know that the stability of the carbocation is most important, so tertiary substrates work the best. Secondary and primary substrates don't react very readily with a SN1 substitution reaction. We need to have the tertiary substrate to best stabilize the carbocation. Compare that to the SN2 reaction where the nucleophilic attack is important and the less crowded that system is, the better. So in order for that attack to take place, we need to have the minimal amount of crowding possible. Primary substrates work well, secondary substrates also work pretty well. Tertiary substrates are not possible to undergo an SN2 reaction. When we talk about the nucleophile for an SN2 reaction, it's involved in the rate determining step. So the stronger the nucleophile, the better. This is going to be in contrast to SN1 reactions where the nucleophile works even if it's a weak or neutral nucleophile because it's not involved in the first rate determining step. It will react with a very reactive carbocation. If we think about the leaving groups, actually the leaving group ability and the weakness of the bond is important for both of these processes. If we can form stable anions, that's ideal. Um, and for both SN1 and SN2, there's not much difference in the leaving group uh, effect on the reaction. Both require good leaving groups and the reactions will go better if the leaving groups are better. In terms of the stereochemical outcome, SN1 reactions form carbocations, which are flat and planar, and thus form a 50-50 mixture of enantiomeric products if you have a uh, stereogenic carbon there, whereas an SN2 reaction occurs with 100% inversion of that stereocenter because we are doing a reaction specifically from the opposite side of the leaving group, kicking it off and inverting those groups on there. The solvents are important, as I mentioned for SN1. We want polar protic solvents because we want the hydrogen bonding to the leaving group. And for an SN2 reaction, we still need polar solvents, but protic solvents tend to inhibit the nucleophile, so the aprotic solvents are the best.